Hey everyone, welcome back to the NPT Podcast. This is Will Crane, your host. Thank you so much for joining me as we go through the content you need in order to dominate on test day. So today we've got a practice question related to the genitourinary system. As you recall, as we're going through this podcast, we go through each of the content outline areas on the FSBPT's published content outline. So in 2024, they are updating the content outline. Those of you who are listening to this podcast, you'll know that the update includes a reduction in the overall number of items and the addition of what they call scenario-based items or items that are related to a case or a patient chart. And you'll answer a handful of questions about that patient chart. So uh, as of the current outline, as of this recording, there will be up to 45 items related to scenarios. So that, that doesn't mean 45 different scenarios. Rather, that means that you'll have 45 questions related to a variety of scenarios. And just a reminder that in those scenarios, they can have, so the scenario would be a patient chart. And you'll look at the patient chart and the patient chart could include uh, a variety of data all the way from the subjective information to the intervention data. And then they'll ask you a multitude of questions or a handful of questions, I should say, related to multiple systems of that patient. So they could ask a musculoskeletal intervention question. They could ask, in addition to that, a non-systems modalities question. And then finally, they could finish it up with some type of system interactions question. So the each case or each scenario will have a variety of questions related to it, albeit there will only be a handful per scenario. Uh, you can't expect that those scenarios will have a variety of questions. So today we've got a practice question related to the genitourinary system. So as per the most recent content outline update, there will be a handful of questions related to the genitourinary system. So somewhere between two and five questions total. So it's not a large section. And, and really, I still stand by my general advice, which is to spend time in the major sections. So cardio, musculo, neuro as your primary source of studying. But don't forget to also study some of these other systems and non-systems as well. Even though they are a smaller portion of the exam, they're still important and you should still spend a little bit of time with them, which is why we're going through a practice question here today. But before I get to that, just a quick reminder, if you haven't yet, be sure to check out the VIP program. So at PT Final Exam, we have a VIP program. This is where we meet twice a week as a small group and we talk about practice questions. We dissect tons and tons of practice questions. In this VIP group, you also have access to book one-on-one -on -one calls with myself. Uh, we have a whole library of content dedicated to the VIP program. In addition to that, you get complimentary access to our other content, including our practice exams, our crash courses, all that comes complimentary as a part of your access to the VIP program. Uh, the other thing that's cool about the VIP program is you get a nine-month access, which means that if you're targeting uh, studying and, and taking the exam sometime next summer or whenever within the next nine months, you'll get the best bang for your buck if you sign up early rather than late so you can make sure to take advantage of all that content, especially as you're going through clinicals. Uh, I know a lot of you in the springtime and early summer that you're finishing up your final clinicals before graduation and then testing sometime either April, July, or October. So again, if you're looking for a great way to study, a great way to stay accountable, and to have a way to, to get lots and lots and lots of practice questions under your belt, I think you'll find no better place than the VIP program over at ptfinalexam.com. And that one, that's the one, the one course that I personally run over on PT Final Exam is that one. We have a multitude of other instructors, which are fabulous for all of our other products, but I think you'll really enjoy that VIP program. All right, let's go and dive into our practice question here for today. So I will read the question to you, give you a moment to respond, and then we'll talk about it together. A patient with a lower lumbar spinal cord injury is most likely to experience which of the following groups of bladder symptoms? So we've got a patient with a lower lumbar spinal cord injury is most likely to experience which of the following groups of bladder symptoms? One, frequency, urgency, dyssynergia, urge incontinence. Two, functional incontinence, cognitive impairment, a contractile detrusor. Three, hypotonic detrusor, weak urine stream, bladder over distension, and four, leakage with increased intra-abdominal pressure, fascial laxity. So again, the options are, well, the question is, a patient with a lower lumbar spinal cord injury is most likely to experience which of the following groups of bladder symptoms? We have one, frequency, urgency, dysenergia, and urge incontinence. Two, functional incontinence, cognitive impairment, a contractile detrusor. Three, 
hypotonic detrusor, weak urine stream, and bladder over distension, and four, leakage with increased intra-abdominal pressure, fascial laxity. All right, so the key to this question is understanding the location of the spinal cord injury. So a lower lumbar spinal cord injury, that occurs uh, obviously in the lumbar spine where the cauda equina exists. And this is these are all considered to be lower motor neurons. And so you would expect lower motor neuron type symptoms. And so therefore the correct answer here is related to uh, someone who has overflow incontinence, which would include a hypotonic or hypoactive or a contractile detrusor muscle, weak urine stream, bladder over distension. So the bladder over distension just means that the bladder fills and fills and fills. It, if you attempt to empty it, the detrusor is only partially active, meaning you only get partial emptying, and then it continues to fill again beyond that. And so you get this steady overflow or overflow incontinence that occurs as a result of that hypoactive bladder or the hypoactive detrusor muscle. So a lot of times this occurs in cases of hypotonius. We're talking about uh, again, cauda equina type injuries, lower motor neuron symptoms. Uh, in this case, uh, we're talking about someone who had a spinal cord injury, uh, but there are other things that could cause this decrease in motor activity. So multiple sclerosis is a little bit of an outlier here. It is, MS is technically an upper motor neuron disorder. However, in the, in the long term with multiple sclerosis, they develop this dyssynergia where you get a hypo, hypertonic sphincter which then leads to overfilling of the bladder. So I guess the, there are some slight exceptions here, but the point is that generally speaking, when we talk about a hypoactive detrusor muscle and that overflow, we're talking about bladder distension, uh, difficulty, difficulty voiding the bladder. Now, the other thing that could occur with overflow incontinence would be some type of urinary or urethral blockage. So in men, the classic one is some type of prostatic hyperplasia. So either prostate cancer, benign prostatic hyperplasia. All these would be cases where if you block the urine outflow, then again, that leads to overfilling of the bladder, which then eventually enough pressure builds inside the bladder that it starts to slowly leak out. And so that's what's called the overflow incontinence. Another, I mean, I guess as far as a, a visual is, if you imagine a cup, let's say you have a cup sitting on your countertop, and let's say you fill it to capacity, but then let's say that you don't empty it, that you continue to fill it, you'll find that it continues to overflow. And so that would be the case for either hypoactive detrusor muscle, so a lower motor neuron disorder, or some type of blockage in, we're talking especially in the case of prostatic hyperplasia, so benign prostatic hyperplasia or prostate cancer. And then a, a bit of the outlier, so in later stages, multiple sclerosis, you get this hyperactive sphincter. So we're talking about the external urethral sphincter, which again would block urine flow and therefore result in the overfull bladder, the overdistended bladder, resulting in overflow incontinence. So these other answer options, frequency, urgency, dysenergia, and urgent continence, uh, this would be some type of neurogenic bladder. So a lot of times we're talking upper motor neuron disorders, uh, medications, alcohol, bladder infections, all these can lead to uh, hyperactive bladder, which would create urge incontinence. So you get these sudden urges where the detrusor just hits and suddenly you, you have to void and there's, there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, functional incontinence, this would be related to some type of cognitive or physical impairment preventing you from getting to the bathroom time. And most of the, most of the time we're talking about Alzheimer's disease, dementia, something where you have uh, some type of severe impairment which alters your mentation. And then finally, uh, the last one, leakage, leakage with intra, increased intra-abdominal pressure or fascial laxity, that would be the case in, uh, in stress urinary incontinence. This is primarily due to weak pelvic floor musculature, but it could also occur due to pelvic floor trauma. We're talking like post-childbirth, where you have fascial laxity, which would result in urine leakage, uh, involuntary urine leakage with increased intra-abdominal pressure, like a cough, a laugh, or a sneeze. Again, in this case, we're talking about someone with a lower lumbar spinal cord injury, they're most likely to exhibit this overflow incontinence because of the hypotonic or acontractile detrusor muscle. All right, so there you go. We have a little discussion on the different types of incontinence. Remember the four main subtypes. We've got urge, overflow, stress, and functional incontinence. We've talked about each of those. 
Uh, we talk about this more in our classes, so be sure to check it out, any of our classes over at ptfinalexam.com. Also, if you haven't yet, be sure to leave us a like, a subscribe, uh, give us a five-star review over on Google Play, Apple iTunes, Spotify, wherever it is you're listening to this podcast. And in the meantime, stay safe out there. Keep a grin on your chin as you go through all the studies. And I'll catch you all in the next episode. Will Crane fist pumps all around. Have a great day. See you soon.